Next on Two Counselors and a Mic. My advisement to them and to anybody in this profession is to reconnect with your love of teaching. Remember your epiphany. Go back to the time when you said, yes, this is what I'm doing. It's very easy to get lost. Thanks for landing on our podcast, where we use the power of our collective stories to make change in the world by expanding our understanding of who we are and how we learn. We're a podcast dedicated to exploring the ever-changing topics related to education. My name is Lisa Johnson Davis, and I am a counselor focusing on how we learn. And my name is Gabriela Baeza Delgado. I am a counselor interested in maximizing our collective ideas to support all students. Welcome back to Two Counselors and a Mic. I'm Lisa. And I'm Gabby. And we're glad you've tuned into our 10th podcast. In this podcast, we will be joined by Dr. Morgan Appel, who is Assistant Dean of Education and Community Outreach at UC San Diego Extension. Gabby, this is our 10th podcast. Woohoo! We made it. We sure did. So in, in true two counselors and a mic fashion, I'm going to ask you the big question. Why did you decide to do this <laughs> podcast? Well, I think I've mentioned before in one of our episodes that you had just said it kind of nonchalantly one day, we should do a podcast. I initially to myself thought, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good idea. Okay. And then I moved on. And then you said it again. And I thought, okay, second time she mentions that. And then I think it might have been the third time you said, no, we should really do a podcast. And I thought, oh, she's really serious about doing a podcast. And I think ultimately, Lisa, when I think why you have a way of exploring new ideas that make it safe. You hmm. present it in a way of like, well, what's the worst that can happen if, if we if we just buy our own mics, and you know after our long days we just go to a quiet place in our in our homes we'll hit record, let's just see what happens and and actually because I trust you, and I I've worked alongside you now and I know that you're not going to lead me down a, a dark path. And so ultimately, I think it comes down to I trusted the idea because I trusted the source mm. and never would I have thought it's going to turn into a, a creative exploration for myself, for us as colleagues. Um, but yeah, ultimately, that's really when I when I think to answer your question directly, the why it's well, because you you presented it in such a unique way of, again, why why can't we explore this option? and tie it into our community engagement work. Why not? And so I appreciate you having that, that instinctive ability to, to bring in an artistic side to our work. So you've awakened that in me. Thank you. I mean, but ultimately you made a choice to, to, to go on that path of me to, to trust. And, you know, I, I was thinking, at my prior school, we are, we were a project-based learning school. And I always used to say in project-based learning, cause that's kind of the methodology, you know, you build your learning around a project and the project's very significant. But even from the beginning, I would always say to anybody who would listen, it's not about the project and project-based learning. It's that the student is the project. And doing this podcast, this is our learning project. We are the students, we are the learners, but you know, you made that choice. You made that choice, Gabby. And I appreciate it. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, and I think honestly, that comes from a place of my own growth and journey as an educator. And there's been times where I've had um, ideas for projects and it didn't wasn't maybe the right time or just wasn't going to be a good fit but I will say when I've taken ideas that are um, I'm presenting to leadership they've actually have always welcomed those new ideas with open arms and said well sounds great Let, let's see what comes of it and so I 
I do, if I, if I could just take a second, just really express gratitude um, to the County Office of Education's leadership because they, we did go to them with this idea that was just in the infancy stages and they just gave their approval and said, you know, well, well let's see what comes of it. Sounds great. So I do want to thank Bruce Peterson, our Executive Director in Student Services and Programs. I want to thank Music Watson, our Chief of Staff at the County Office of Education. And a big shout out to Dr. Paul Gothold, who's our County Office of Ed Superintendent. Going back to when you asked me the why, Lisa, you know, they have trust in what we do. They have trust in us as employees and as, as servant leaders. And yeah. that means a lot. That really, I'm coming from a, a deep place of gratitude uh, right now because that means a lot. It makes you want to do more. It makes you want to give more, right? Because I know I have trust in them and they've got trust in us, but you're right. It comes down to a choice. And if you think about the nine preceding episodes we've had, everyone in there was faced with different choices to make. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a common theme throughout the season that it's choices that we're faced with and it's what do we do with them? When you're faced with these choices, which, which fork in the road, right? Situation is going to determine the path that you're going to eventually take. So there's a, there's a lot in each episode for us to unpack. I'm sure Morgan's going to even give us, you know, more, but really it comes down to the choices. And I think being open, once we remain open, I mean, the ability to be free and dream is let in. I think that's the key. I mean, I think that's even in a Harry Potter. I can't remember what book number that is where Dumbledore says, it's all about the choices we make, Harry. <laughs> You know, and I, I hear um, Joe Rowling in that because it does, it comes down and, you know, that's apropos for this 10th podcast to really talk about the fact that, you know, we're at a juncture right now, that proverbial fork in the road where we do have to make some choices about how we want to move forward. And I'm just struck, um, I don't know, um, you don't know this, Gabby, but I am really a, a history buff on one particular part of American history, which is a California story called um, the Donner Party, not a story. But whenever anybody talks about the Donner Party in California we and beyond, it's always kind of reverts down to what ended up happening after they got snowed in in the 1840s, which was, um, you know, not a really great thing because they had to survive. I won't go into it. But that story for me, when you really start to de delve deep into it, it is about a fork in the road, like literally when they were coming um, on um, this kind of manifest destiny, which we could unpack that at a later date and what that was all about. But when they were coming, you know, to the West, trying to seek new, new places and opportunities, they, the Donner Party went, made a choice to go down a new path instead of the Oregon Trail. And it was interesting because along the way, when, if you study it, it is really just like this unfolding of kind of bad choices. <laughs> At the end, they really should have gone down that Oregon Trail and everything would have been went helpful. And, um, but what, one of the things that's just very profound about that is that they didn't have trust in each other. They really weren't creative in their, in their endeavors. Um, there, there wasn't a lot of listening either. It was kind of a top-down structure and, you know, you're going to go our way or the highway. And, you know, unfortunately, we do see that just in, in the way that education is, is laid out. We, we see some of those structures in play as well. And I think this podcast has really taught us through all the stories that have been interwoven that you always get to this point where you have a choice. You have a choice to consistently reinvent hit the reset button, bing, and, you know, be able to move forward in a different way. And that's what makes us human. We get stuck in making, you know, choices that are kind of the same because we're scared. And there's a lot of fear right now. You know, if you're an administrator and you're a superintendent or assistant superintendent and you're trying, you know, to, to manage all of this stuff, you don't really think you have time to be creative because, you know, you have parents that are asking you and your teachers and how, how do you kind of hit that reset button and, and maybe think about, that's just the start, you know, think about something different. 
And in San Diego, there's so many um, creative leaders that are really just in that process of thinking through things mm -hmm. and asking questions and getting all of the, like we say, data, you know, to, to make informed decisions. But it's kind of also the heart decision of, do they have the structures in place? Do they have the trust in place mm -hmm. to be able to innovate and be creative? And that's where we're at right now. Well said, Lisa. And, you know, I, I definitely think one of the creative minds that we are uh, lucky enough to have in our county is Dr. Morgan Appel. So I'm excited to, to bring him on. I am as well, Gabby. So without further ado, let's get to our interview. And now our special guest. Welcome, Morgan. We are going to just dive in. We're very appreciative of all of your um, mentorship, and we've had the fortune of being able to work with Morgan as we've even developed this podcast. So thank you again for all of your support, Morgan. But we would like to dive in with, with our first question to you, which is, how did you get to where you are today? What was the bug? And maybe if you could explain too to our audiences, because we're all telling our stories, how that happened to you, childhood, adolescence, where you are now, anything that you would like to, to kind of talk about your journey. Of course. And, and I would love to tell you that when I was born, I wanted to be a teacher and, and I knew that and it was a, a straight line into education, but I actually went through a labyrinth of different avenues before arriving at education. And I will tell you the last thing that I wanted to do as a child and a wayward lad was to be involved in education. I'll tell you why. Um, both of my parents uh, taught at UC Berkeley and my father also taught at UC San Francisco. I grew up in Berkeley and although I had a lot of fun on the Cal campus and a lot of fun on Telegraph Avenue, the thing I knew that I did not want to do is be in education. Whatever the opposite of that was, that's what I wanted to do. And in the late 1980s, early 1990s, that meant getting an MBA and going into corporate law. That was the, the diametric opposition to doing good in the world really as sort of a theme in the, in the late 1980s. What wound up happening, I was in my first year of business school, committed to my path and wanted to earn a little bit of extra money. And I was offered the opportunity to teach a section of statistics, which looking back was probably a poor decision on the uh, part of the Department of Social Sciences because I am uh, a math phobe didn't really know much about statistics, but I sort of boned up and, and went in and started to use examples uh, drawn from popular culture. Beverly Hills 90210 was a big show at the time and communicating with undergraduates about how to uh, calculate the mean, I used sideburn lengths. And as I looked out into my section, I saw that these undergraduates were beginning to get it and they were actually starting to enjoy the process. And my fate was sealed right there. I think that this is more of a calling than a career. And I think it was then that I had my epiphany as well as uh, the rest of the class. They were having statistical epiphanies and I had a career epiphany. And I will also say that I think that everybody who is in education, admitted or not, that they are frustrated performers and it's great to have a captive audience. And when they hang on your every word, that is even better. Not saying that that happened, but it was certainly aspirational. So my whole career path at that point changed. And I thought, wait, you can actually do this for a living because I'm you know, on a campus full of people who do. So I, I uh, went on to doctoral studies in um, first in public policy and then in educational administration. And I really, come to think of it, have never really uh, left the loving arms of Mother University 
probably, uh, you know, since uh, the, the early 1980s. So that is my twist and turns. I spent a lot of time in policy uh, administration at a university connected policy institute called the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute, and also uh, was an arts and education faculty researcher at the Claire Trevor School of the Arts at UC Irvine. And my, my background and passion is in the visual and, and performing arts. So it was a, a really a natural fit. And then I sort of meandered through different types of positions in, in, in post-secondary education before winding up where I am now as Assistant Dean for Education and Community Outreach at UC San Diego Extension. Well, Morgan, I think you are the first person I've ever met or heard say that they used 90210 as a teaching tool. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, if you can teach the statistics by examining sideburns, it tells me you are a creative soul that can take something that doesn't look like a lot and make it into something beautiful and engage students in learning. And I, I, I absolutely love that you were able to do that. I wanted to know why you fought back against something that seemed like part of your genetics you would think so you know i and and i think people would say oh you're just going to go and into the into the family business but i really i and i think as most adolescents and and young people do you want to sort of stake your own claim in the world and um it was so ubiquitous and pervasive that i felt that i wasn't really having any new experiences and i was still drawn to it intermittently i mean there were there were times in school, there were times when I was at, at the community college where I felt, wow, this is something that I really could do. But I resisted with, with full force and until such time that, you know, it, it became a tipping point. It became just so overwhelming that it sort of course corrected me to where I was supposed to go. Looking back, if, if had I gone along that path all along, I probably would not value it as much as I do today because I can really think of nothing better than this. Um, And every day that I am upright, I'm thankful to to be able to do this. Along those lines, I'm curious, Morgan, you know, because you you've now been in the field for for some time and I've seen, I'm sure, lots of trends and different phases that we've all gone through Mm -hmm. in K through 12 and also in higher ed. During our, our in our present time right now with the impact of COVID, what are some of the opportunities that you have seen come about with COVID? And then also, what are, what are some of the challenges that you have experienced uh, in your higher ed setting? Well, I, I, I think that the, the, the challenges are manifold. And I, I don't think they're really anything new. But I think this, uh, the pandemic and, and the tumult in the world has really served to rip the bandage off. And I, I think what we're seeing now are sort of uh, pre-existing conditions that have been amplified and magnified and lent a sense of urgency. I think all of the disparity, all of the inequity, all of the access, those issues have always been around. But I think that with the overlay of the pandemic, it's uh, illuminated it and it's compelled us to act more quickly. So I think that is a challenge throughout the education system because what the pandemic and everything else that's going on has done is thrown us off our equilibrium. And I think that the great thing about education, regardless from where one comes, is that there's a certain sense of stability and predictability. And going to school every day, having a routine, you know, may be the only source of predictability or stability in somebody's life. And I think what we're finding is not only are we you know, on shaky ground once, but we find our footing and the ground starts to shake again. And everybody keeps referring to the new normal, but the new normal is neither. And we keep trying to find our, our, our sense of, of stasis and you know, so we can go on to more. And really what we're finding both in K-12 and in uh, post-secondary education is that our focus now has to be more Maslow than Bloom because it doesn't matter what degree of instructional sorcery you have up your sleeve, unless people have a sense of peace of mind, a sense of solace, you won't be able to move forward. Now, I know that's a lot of doom and gloom and, and, and perhaps rightly so, but I think there is a silver lining that it can be found within this dark cloud is, and it is that 
teachers now have the unique opportunity to reconnect with their creative, intuitive pedagogical artistry that we are all now in a condition where none of the same rules really apply. So when we first started doing distance learning and remote learning, our instincts were to, I'm going to turn on the webcam and I'm going to do my six hour thing. Or I'm going to do my 50 minute period thing. But it's, it's different. Differentiation is incredibly different online um, or in a blended way than it is face to face. And some of our most vulnerable populations who are already, you know, suffering from lack of lack of access, lack of connectivity, and, and the, the sense of stability that school provides, that's a whole nother area to deal with. I think it also provides a unique opportunity for community, school communities to come together and to cultivate social capital and start to empower our communities. Because when schools are struggling to do the, the job, it's really the parents and the families and communities will say, okay, let us support you now. Here is what we can do together. So we've attended to all of this with a real sense of emergency. And I think the danger that we have involved is that we need to really attend to the social emotional lest we risk chronic toxic stress. Because when you get to that point, without support, that's when the microarchitecture of the brain can change. And that is where you see people giving up, where you see large degrees of attrition. Now is the time that we can all come together. And I think what you are doing here is a perfect example of that, where you are drawing resources from within different types of communities to say, let's all come together, Let us, let's engage in collaborative, reciprocal, symbiotic solution finding versus this is, you know, I'm going to come down from the university riding on a white steed and say, we've got the answer for you. I love that you said that because as somebody who also shares your passion for community engagement and who has done that work, sometimes it's very ethereal to explain to somebody how that whole community piece can manifest itself in a way that you might be able to see, you know, the results of or, or forecast the results of your labor five years down the line, you know, if you put those building blocks in place. So I'm just building on what you were saying about that community piece. That is kind of the antithesis of what schooling is. It's that siloed building, you know, time is very structured. So mm -hmm. maybe if you could talk about like for you as this person who is in the community, how does that look like now? Or how do you think it could look like? How could it transform these spaces apart from time, space, mm -hmm. even function? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is really another advantage um, that, that we can explore. Because now we are really divorced from that very linear, very structured, bell-driven day that harkens back, I, I would say, prior to the Industrial Revolution, all the way back to sort of agrarian times. And we have been trying to put patchwork on the factory model of schooling for, for years. And it really doesn't suit. But now here we are in a situation where we are exploring different ways because that, that whole structure is absent and it can feel chaotic, but there is lots of opportunity embedded. So I, I, I think it does present a unique opportunity to engage communities. But I think you can't, I, I think the, the fatal flaw that some schools make and some universities make is that, well, all I have to do is show up and I will come with a solution. There may be some discussion around that, but there are embedded cultures within communities that have pre, you know, predated your arrival for centuries. And the way that we work, at least in, in my department, is we are good listeners first, and we move at the pace of trust. And we feel that it is much better to be invited in as a partner than to come and say, look, here we have all of this for you, come and pick it out. And I think this represents a larger theme in education. So as, as we look forward into the future, um, we have the ability, I mean, we talk about differentiation we talked about uh, and we talk about compacting and tiering 
our technologies and our resources allow us to go beyond that towards individualization of instruction. But I think what you will find is that the way that education is, is presented is going to look a lot different. It is going to come in a variety of forms and it is going to be custom designed, custom tailored to those who engage it. And when we talk about meeting people where they are, usually when we talk about that, we'll, we'll say, okay, we'll do a pre-assessment and meet you where you are. I'm, I'm actually talking geographically and physically where we meet people where they are and we build out together. And what we wind up doing rather than being transporters of knowledge and saying here, here's some for you, here's a little bit for you, and this goes to the equality versus equity question, we say we are here as your partner across the zone of proximal development. Sometimes we'll, we'll take one over, sometimes we'll go in small groups, but the job of the educator is, is much different. I think as, as we approach the future, where there's going to be a lot more involved in finding joy and cultivating um, engagement and passion for learning rather than, I mean, and there's always gonna be a place for dates and times and, and histories and, and things like that. But I think one of the things that we're learning um, is the importance of narrative, uh, the importance of the arts as telling our stories as humans. And it's interesting because everybody's talking about STEM and then they were talking about STEAM and I guess they're adding reading and now it's going to be stream, whatever fits the acronym. But this is really nothing that's new. This is how the brain learns anyway. The brain gathers data from a variety of different sources to, to solve immediate problems. So this sort of interdisciplinary work I mean, that's been done since our time as, as cave people. And you can see that in the, the, the cave drawings at La Salle all the way to, to what you've seen now. Um, and really even Da Vinci has a great quote about a divided kingdoms and divided minds saying, you know, if you're parsed out like this, it, that's not how the brain likes to learn because the brain sees things as wholes, not necessarily as parts. And that sort of parsing out and, and linear and structured that all sort of came out of the industrial revolution and what the purpose of public schooling was at the time. So I think we are moving there more quickly perhaps than we were before. And I think that the pandemic may have opened a door to that. And you know we wanna make sure that that door stays open for creative ways of thinking. Absolutely. You know, you said something and I feel like I'm in a lecture hall because, you know, the good college, oh, no. You know I mean? no, in a good way, I'm, I'm writing all these notes mm -hmm. because you're, you're saying such important things. But one that really resonated with me is you said, we move at the pace of trust. Mm -hmm. so of course, I jotted that down. And I thought, I, I, I like that for, for many reasons, but I, I would love it if you wouldn't mind explore that with us a little bit deeper because I think for our listeners who might be teachers, they might be um, school administrators, it could be our expanded learning staff maybe considering going into education. Mm -hmm. That's a big piece that oftentimes is not explicitly just taught in our courses, in our credentialing programs or in higher ed, unless you have someone that is going to really role model that for you. So what does that look like for, for someone who works in education, how do we go about building that sense of trust and moving at that pace with our teams or our school sites or within our classrooms? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it was a, a painful lesson that I learned early on when I uh, was engaged in doctoral study. I was working with a project, um, and this was in, 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 not to tell tales out of school, a, a rather large district just slightly north of us. Um, but our, we were uh, to collect data from, from teachers. So as an ardent young graduate student, I, 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 went, I went back to the literature and I said, okay, we have to have all of these questions that can be cross-referenced and, and all of this. So we came with a 100 question survey. And this, this was for a group of teachers, many of whom were veterans. I walked in there very confident, you know, here I am, I'm from the university, I've got the knowledge, and here's what I'd like you to do. They took one look at it. 
the veteran teachers did side eyes to the younger teachers. Like, don't you dare start feeling this. It was nonverbal communication that I picked up on really quickly. And they all just sort of sat and stared with me at me. And I thought, you know, first of all, what have, first of all, what have I done wrong? And then second of all, I thought, but the, you know, the university is a bastion of knowledge and we're here to help, you know, why would I get this pushback? Not thinking at the time that what the environment was like, um, you know, how many times uh, schools and teachers have been burned before. And that really stuck with me moving forward into community service, where I think the fatal flaw that uh, you, you see, uh, I mean, you have ardent and well-meaning, well-intentioned people, but you know what they say about the path to hell and good intentions. You really have to engage in, in solution finding with the community. And that just doesn't happen by showing up at one meeting or that, you know, you, you don't come in already uh, sort of pre-approved. So the lesson that I learned is get to know the place first. Listen, become a part of the community before you start to do work within the community. And I think when we actually talk about the, the pace of work and, and commitment to work and support of work, when you move at the pace of trust, it, you can really talk about issues, you can come to a consensus and you can understand the importance of who's not at the table is perhaps more important than who is there. And I think that at least in, in our area uh, of the university, we make investments and, and communities. So we don't go in, in capriciously, we don't go in for short terms, we're not transactional, it's relational. So when we make these long-term commitments, um, what we find is the relationship is reciprocal and we wind up learning more from our communities than we could possibly uh, provide to them. And everybody has resources that, can sh that we can share. And I think this is so important in the current context is, as schools are struggling to, to maintain a sense of integrity, and I'm not speaking of integrity in, in academic terms, but really um, to, to keep the community whole and to attend to the needs of all the stakeholders. This is very difficult, I think, also for administrators who, you know, have the entirety of the school community population scattered to the winds. But I think what this does is making this sort of investment in communities and partnering with communities in real ways, reciproc real reciprocal partnerships and organically defining issues, organically defining solutions, you see that these resources can be marshaled to help any member of the community. So when a school struggles in the community, the rest of the community can come together to support it. Um, that lesson was reinforced in uh, some work we did with the Isleta Independent School District in the, gosh, I want to say probably 1997 when we, uh, I think it was featured in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books about a sort of a transformative experience at the small school district in El Paso. So of course, we as, again, as intrepid uh, young researchers all boarded a plane and we said, let's get to the bottom of this, let's figure out what's going on. Um, and what we found is that when a school is completely integrated into a community in all senses of what that means, that the community rallies because the school is part of the community, not an island sort of sitting in the middle um, with a, you know, a whole set of different uh, customs and a whole set of different ideas. And you know, it's the same thing for post-secondary institutions. University, especially the University of California, which is bound by the Morrill Act to serve communities, I think that we are, I, at least I can speak in so far as what I see at UC San Diego, where we are beginning to, to really understand exactly what that means and, and how we can make investments in communities and how communities can make investments and us. And I'm, I'm keenly aware that sometimes, you know, we are looked at the, the cold, hard science campus on the hill. And I think that we are coming down the hill, not as, as saviors, but as learners. And I think that's what, that's where we start. And it takes as long as it takes. Start slow. 
allow, the, allow time for success. It parallels brain learning. A little success goes a long way. It's almost as if we forget that we are nested within this community. And it's, it's interesting because the expanded learning part of the federal expanded learning initiative is called community learning centers. So, you know, the impetus is to try to create these communities, but it's almost like it's artificial in some way because the community's already there. It's, it's just, mm -hmm. it's reconnecting the community to school. So I'm wondering, I have a couple of questions and I think Gabby's mm -hmm. going to ask you the, the big one at the end, but before sure. you, I wanted to ask you if you had a toolkit and you were able to say to current administrators that are, you know, building these programs are trying their best to figure out what to do. And there were top three tools in your toolkit. That's the only thing you could provide to them. What would those be? What would you say to administrators? teachers right now use these three tools just start with these three tools in your in your learning environments what would those be um you know and and when we think of tools i think of something sophisticated and i think well here's here's an elaborate process by which we can attack this problem and i think that's sort of where we go but i think what i provide is somewhat uh more rudimentary somewhat more fundamental um the 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 first is uh, really um, to really gain a sense of cultural competency and, and cultural proficiency and, and, and everything that goes with that, including the difference between equity, equality, and justice. So to, to, to provide that background, because again, unless you are in a brand new community with a brand new school and a brand new staff and brand new kids, you are coming into a culture that has predated you often for decades. There's, there's been stuff that's been going on here that you can't even. So, you know, I appreciate people who have solutions and who want to fix problems, but cultural proficiency and also listening, the, the ability to just sit down, be quiet and, and listen, watch the world around you, get a better sense. Beyond that, I would, and I, I teach an administrative services credential and I program, and I can see the, the enthusiasm and, and the gregariousness of the sort of new administrators who are making the transition from teacher to educational leader. And they're thinking of, you know, what does, what does my, uh, you know, what does my kingdom look like? And my, my advisement to them and to anybody in this profession is to reconnect with your love of teaching. Remember your epiphany. Go back to the time when you said, yes, this is what I'm doing. It's very easy to get lost. And I think when we talk about conventional credentialing programs, where we really aren't talking about creative pedagogy. We're not talking about love of the endeavor. We're not talking about teachers as artists, because I think what you will find, and I think, you know, when, when I work with teachers, the gifted and talented, I will always tell them, you have an innate pedagogical artistry. You have that skill within you to create masterpieces. We can give you a palette of approaches and a palette of strategies that you can use as brushes and tools and paints, but it's you, it's what's in you that creates the masterpiece. Most of the people who are doing this job are doing it pretty well. They may know, not know the, the, the rationale behind it. They may not know the brain science behind it. They may not know the um, socio-emotional elements of it, but they're doing it and they're doing it well and they keep doing it without really thinking about it. And I think it's easy in a credential program or it's easy as a professional to get lost in the minutia you will drown in, in details, whether it's filling out forms or whether it's uh, facilities, you've got to reconnect, you've got to take time. This, and a lot of this is self-care, but you've got to tap into your own creativity and you've got to reconnect with the epiphany that led you here. So I think really those are the foundations. Those are the building blocks upon which you can scaffold other things. But if you believe in yourself, if you believe in your own innate artistry, if you understand 
the, the essential human value of everyone around you and are able to better understand their circumstances and, and, and build from that and, and work with them. And if you can take the time to, to listen and to be a part of the solution rather than the solution, your days will be much happier. And I think this all goes to finding a, a sense of flow, which is um, Lisa and Gabby, as you know, comes out of, um, I, I was going to say pop psychology, positive psychology during the, 19, the 1970s. But the, this idea, and, and I think that your, your classroom may not look like you'd imagine it would, but it's going to be a wonderful learning environment. And you're going to cultivate a long-term love of learning. The love of learning is sometimes more important than the learning itself. So along those lines, Morgan, our final question for you <clears throat> is, if you had a magic wand, you could wave that wand and can see what education will look like 10 years from now, what do you hope to see? I, I don't want to say we've reached a breaking point, but I certainly think that we have reached a point at which we have some creative latitude to deviate from the traditional path. And you see this in the workplace too. You know, as everybody has to come to the office for eight hours a day, you know, you can't work from home and now they're finding, wow, people are really much, you know, more comfortable in some cases there. I think that if I had a, a magic wand or a crystal ball, I would hope that educational experiences are, are, are much more innovative and integrated and individualized. So the idea, I mean, we, we talk about depth and complexity and we talk about sort of, you know, people learn better when they're learning something that they like to learn. But I think we have the ability and I think teachers have the, the innate creativity to be able to really do something that taps into the needs of the individual. And one of the problems, and I think sometimes uh, remote learning helps because you're able to sort of see into the lives of your students a bit better, is that much of our work as educators is detective work. People don't come to us with a sign hanging around their neck saying, I'm a visual learner with test anxiety. Most of the year, you're trying to ferret that out. I would, and as part of this idea of integrated and interwoven experiential learning, this rigidity associated with the clock and the bells system that, that you know, dates back to the times of the assembly line. We know, that, at least with efforts in STEAM, we're talking about fluidity and we're talking about integration and the porousness of disciplines, but it's not realized when it's parsed out in such a linear way. So I would like, uh, uh, ideally, to see something that's more personalized, but also more flexible. And we know that we all learn in different ways. We all know about learning uh, modalities and, and learning styles, but they're also the way that we use time. I'd also like to see a lot more freedom to fail. We talk about teaching resilience, but we never give the opportunity for kids to be resilient. So sometimes you're going to fall flat. And when you go out into the university, when you go out into the workforce, you're going to fall flat more times than you'd care to know. But if we're serious about growth mindset and if we're serious about building resilience, you've, you've got to, uh, you know, uh, allow things to take a different course without a detrimental consequences. I think what I'm, I'm getting at is, is learning the way it was done in the time of the ancients. Now, I, I'm not saying that, okay, we're going to take all of the, the desks and chairs out and we're all going to sit at opposite ends of the log and we're going to amuse. But I think we have the technology and the wherewithal to really tailor something to the, to the needs of kids while operating within the parameters. It's really sort of the, the, the structures and frameworks that, are, uh, that serve to inhibit. And then, of course, I think learning modalities are going to look very, very different. I think once we sort out Zoom and Zoom fatigue and, and different ways of remote learning, I think it's going to be, you're going to see a lot more blended learning. I think learning is going to, I, some in some cases, will be more autodidactic. I think we're going to move from pedagogy 
in through andragogy and then all the way into hudagogy, where kids become more self-aware of the way that they learn and they will apply that to other things in life. What I'm hoping also is we talk about essential 21st century skills in the abstract and application of those skills, but I think if they are interwoven into a, a body of knowledge that you point them out and say, what you are doing here is X. And then certainly I think kids deserve to know how they learn. It, this whole brain compatible learning business that we all study should not be a secret. It's not like, ha ha, you know, I'm, I'm going to fool you and I'm going to, you know, take a, a, a bow at the end. Kids should know this, this is why you're having, you're struggling with this. And this is why you are connected to this. So I, I would like, uh, I would like to see that. And I think that post-secondary education will uh, be drawn sometimes kicking and screaming. I think we're headed there. Um, I don't think we're as wed to disciplines as we have been in previous times. I think we understand the value of coordinated work. And certainly I would like to see universities be more equitable environments. And I think we're figuring that out, long time coming. But that's what I'd imagine. If I had a wand, I mean, it will probably take as long to do it as, as I said it, because I feel like I've been talking for 20 years. But that's what I'd see. That's what I'd hope for. Well, Morgan, it has been a pleasure um, having you on the podcast with us today. You know, what's neat about having this podcast, uh, and you've been part of our, Lisa, and my own uh, creative journey with this, so we're very appreciative of that. You know, we're going to get to 10 years down the road. I'm going to replay the podcast and then see, let's see, let's wave that wand um, mm-hmm. in reverse and see, let's, did those things stick? Mm-hmm. Well, I will tell you, I will, I will be there in your flying car with you, Gabby, and, and, we, and we can um, put it on, on the headsets and, and we will we'll see if it comes true. But I've, I've got to say this, for me, this was really an absolute pleasure uh, that the two of you are vanguards in this, in this field. So, um, you know, you, you mentioned mentorship. You are my mentors as well. And I wish I could record every conversation that we have together. Well, maybe we should. And, and in that flying car, there'll be um, Morgan holding his book, Reconnect with Your Epiphany. There you go. Reconnect <laughs> I, I, with Your Epiphany. That's, that's, your, that's your book. I'm, I'm going to wait until you, you write that, even if it's mm-hmm. just a small, short um, musing. But thank you, Morgan. It's been awesome. You are our 10th podcast. So this is our season finale. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we're looking uh, forward to another 10 episodes for next season where maybe we'll have you back and you can explore more about what reconnecting with your epiphany looks like. I'm, I'm so intrigued by that. But I, Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll be the cliffhanger season finale and I'll be back next season. And now our closing thoughts. What stands out? What resonated the most with you? Oh my gosh. My mind was just going pow, pow, pow. <laughs> Every, at every turn, like, um, I think he's the one when I was saying you had us at sideburns because you're the, you know, he's the yeah. one that you search for when you go to university. He's that professor. That's just like a goodwill hunting kind of thing. Like you're going to come out of there, you know, captain oh my captain standing on the, the school desk because you're just like, so, you know, overpowered and joyful about, this person who actually harnesses what we all have, which is this creativity that we're kind of born into this life. And I I think, you know, we just had this equity training um, this morning, Gabby, and it just, we were talking about potential. And for me, Morgan, he is just the epitome of, harvesting that potential, you know, being able to provide the landscape for, for all of us, you know, educators, teachers, administrators. And, and if we can do that, we can harvest the potential of our, our students, you know, of our young people. So blown away. I'm just blown away every time we talk to them. Same here. And I loved your question of the, the top three tools that you would recommend to educators you know, teachers, administrators, and he mentioned gain a sense of cultural proficiency, listening. But the third one, I, I loved it. It's uh, reconnect to your love of teaching. And I, 
you know, I think he hit it um, several times in the interview is that we haven't given teachers and or other educators the ability especially during COVID, to even reconnect or explore the idea that they actually enjoy the work because we were so bombarded and, it, and are still really in crisis mode and have this overwhelming sense of, of urgency to you know, not have students fall behind. And so everyone, I feel like we're just like holding our breath. And when he said that, I thought that's the key is I don't want our teacher colleagues or our counselor colleagues to then feel like, oh, I got to get out. Uh, this is it. This is the writing on the wall. I, it, it, I, I need to, to leave education now. This is the, the hardest that they're probably going to ever, uh, the hardest experience probably in their career. No, I mean, we're going to have this shared experience. We all will. But I, I would hope that people would tap into what Morgan said, which is reconnect, reconnect to that love that brought you here mm -hmm. and look past the challenge of what what COVID is is really surfacing for all of us, and mm -hmm. I know that may sound a lot easier than it is um, done. But if we do not reconnect to our why, if we don't do that now, we will lose very good people who just who are already even before COVID were already at that place of I'm nearing that sense of uh, compassion fatigue and then burnout. Yeah, they were, we were, a lot of us were already there before because of the nature of our work. Mm -hmm. And then that's why I think COVID is it just, you know, it really sent a lot of folks to that edge of, I'm not quite so sure I want to continue. But when he said, reconnect to your love of teaching, I thought that's the piece that, that I would want our listeners to, to really hear is you have to reconnect to why you do it. Mm -hmm. Go back to those stories of the kids that you served go back to those kids and think, oh my gosh, that one kid that I didn't think was going to make it, I stuck, I stuck it out with them and they made it, right? And then that fills our cup again because you realize that's why I'm in it. That's why I put in the long hours because it made a difference to that kid, it made a difference to that family. So I think now more than ever, people need that because we're still in it. You know, I don't know quite when it's going to end, but we're still in it. And I worry that people will, will reach that, like I said, that sense of burnout. But if they can reconnect, that hopefully will, will change the traje trajectory for them um, and, and keep them in the game because we can't lose them. Yes, we are at a point where we really, I, I envision this big red button kind of like that. Um, I think it's Staples or whatever. Morgan and his colleagues are reinventing their website and some of their um, kind of thoughts around um, education and how to help people in the community to access all of the fount of knowledge that they have and all the partnerships they've made. And so one of the things that we were talking about, as you know, is this idea of like hitting a big red button and you know, there needs to be something on the website that's like reset learning, you know, and, and, and where people can then come to this, this spot where they're interested or, you know, they have ideas or whatever. It could be this, this portal for just rethinking learning, but we're, we're at a, we're at a fork in the road, Gabby. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things I think that you as an educator, a teacher, a human being, um, we, we have to make that choice whether we want to kind of stay with the way that we've done it for you know, over a century, this assembly line, real way of looking at learning that is not individual, no matter what we say it is, you know, if we're trying to differentiate, it's, it's still not individualized because it doesn't take into account, like Morgan was saying, the culture that does already exist in that community and with mm -hmm. that, that child. Mm -hmm. Or we make the decision to say, we don't know what the answers are, but there are a couple of foundational things. We are creative, even mm -hmm. if we don't think we are. Life is a creative process mm -hmm. to get from one day to the next, the amount of problem solving that you've done, whether you, you know, consciously recognize it or not, it's a creative process. Mm -hmm. So if, if we just harness that creativity of problem solving, who knows what we'll create? We don't know what it looks like now. Right. But I feel that our young people have actually reconnected with the truth of learning 
And that's why they've been pushing. So it'll be interesting to see how they move the tide and, and will they make the choice for us, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. D, D, this is the 10th episode in our first series. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, what's one thing that you learned in our podcast process slash journey? You know, I think it's, you have a dream. If you have an idea, just try it. Just go down that path. We need to be in a place where we're learning Mm -hmm. and we do that at home. It's natural. If we don't know something, you know, we will learn it and our kids see that and we're role models for them, but maybe we don't do that so much in, in education. And it's what, what Morgan was saying. It's like almost the permission to fail. It's mm-hmm. okay. I would kind of make a call to action for administrators, um, just school structure in general. Can we get permission to try new things. And, you know, in the first couple podcasts, you probably, everybody will hear I and mean, we're focusing on our, our volume and trying to figure this out. And, and we didn't even know how that was going to come together. And Gabe was helping coach us, telling us we've got to have this and this and this, but in the end of the day, it all happened organically. And it's been amazing, Gabby, to be able to be on this journey with you. Same here. When you were sharing, I thought, you know, this is an example for those who are listening. Really, the idea originated from you, Lisa, about, and I think I said this in, the, in, our, in our introductory uh, segment, which was, you said, we should do a podcast. And I said to you, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And then you said it again. I thought, oh, okay, here she goes saying it again. <laughs> then you might have said it a third time. And then I realized, oh, no, this woman's actually really serious about a podcast. <laughs> I was. <laughs> and then you said, look, we'll just buy the mics, you know, we'll just hit record and we'll see what happens. And so I I say that for folks listening, because we didn't start off saying, you know, we want to have this completely polished, you know, episode. And we've done a lot of hard work in the evenings and on the weekends to edit and make things as polished as they could be for amateur, amateur uh, podcasters. But I will say this is an example of when you're just given the flexibility and freedom to be creative within the constructs of your workspace and say, just try it. I appreciate everyone who, who gave of their time and was willing to take a risk and, and share with us because it is, you know, going to be shared publicly. And I know that's a risk for, for folks. So I'm extremely humbled by the experience and just very grateful. You took the words out of my mouth. I ditto that. Thank you, Gabby, for for just kind of giving us all that that capstone. We are really looking forward to our next season. If you are interested in sharing your story with us, we would love to hear you. Please go ahead and put comments in any of the podcasts. um, Give us your information. Maybe tell us a little bit about your story. And who knows, we might be connecting with you. But on that note, this is our 10th episode of Two Counselors and a Mic. I'm Lisa. And I'm Gabby. We'll see you next season. Two Counselors and a Mic is brought to you by the Learning is Expanding Lab, a unique community engagement initiative powered by the San Diego County Office of Education. In these unprecedented times, we are anchored by the reality that learning is expanding. This 10 episode podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of UCSD Extension, our partner, Made It Media, our special guests, and you, our listeners. 